All right, thank you. Sorry, thank you for having me at this awesome venue. Uh, I think he did a real good job in uh, summarizing a little bit the beginnings of how I got here. So the rest is uh, I started organizing the first data meetup in Los Angeles in 2009. And I'm really glad that here in Budapest there is also a very nice community of meetups and conferences like this one. So thank you for having me here. And uh, everything I say has, uh, don't blame my employer. So they are really nice people. I like, I am not that nice. Uh, so I will start with deep learning. I think probably most of you have seen this famous slide from Andrew Ang. He's trying to convince us all that uh, uh, basically deep learning is this new machine learning method that beats every other machine learning algorithm and you don't need anything else than just deep learning. And uh, we hope to have uh, self-driving cars with deep learning and deep learning has certainly had immense success in uh, virtual environments like playing games. But uh, unfortunately, deep learning is not really the silver bullet for all machine learning. And unfortunately also, like the media is hyping this deep learning, machine learning, and AI so much that most people think of machine learning and AI as something like this, when we are actually pretty far, I think. So indeed, deep learning has had tremendous success for uh, all kinds of solving problems uh, with images and in several other domains, like speech recognition, uh, also, LSTMs have had success in predicting time series and combined with reinforcement learning. Uh, indeed, deep learning had great success in virtual environments such as like playing games. Uh, they, they have attained now uh, uh, above human level performance. But I don't think that deep learning is going to necessarily get us to AI. And uh, some of the fathers of deep learning also are starting lately to talk about uh, the same issue, that they are not really sure if the way forward is deep learning. And unfortunately, deep learning is kind of overshadowing a little bit all the success we had with traditional machine learning over the many, many years. So there are a few problems which, uh, in which machine learning, traditional machine learning, has had success for over 20 years. So uh, some of us have been doing fraud detection or credit scoring or marketing analytics and many other problems solved with machine learning for like 15, 20, and even more years. Uh, machine learning also has been very successful in uh, detecting, detecting uh, faults in manufacturing or in, insur in many other applications, in insurance, in telecoms, in a lot of places we actually been using machine learning and quite successfully. And then the natural question comes that why not use deep learning in all these domains? And uh, I've been playing with deep learning uh, in, uh, uh, at work and also with a couple of public data sets. And over and over again, many other domains, it turns out that deep learning is not necessarily the best. Here is some results that I published on GitHub uh, on a public uh, airline prediction data set. And I played a lot with this and tried to tune deep learning, different architecture, and I never got close to other most, more traditional machine learning methods. I never managed to get the same accuracy. And uh, some other people have reached later similar conclusion. Uh, there is Kaggle, which is, they have a lot of, um, data science machine learning competitions where you are 
given some data set, and then you need to predict, and then people are competing on that. And uh, many times it's not deep learning that uh, is the winning solution. So uh, there is one other popular method called gradient boosting machines and an implementation XGBoost that was the uh, first implementation that got quite attention through Kaggles. And uh, here's the author of XGBoost giving a talk at my meetup in Los Angeles a few years back and saying that at that time, about two thirds of the Kaggles were won by XGBoost or some kind of combination of XGBoost and not by deep learning. So here's kind of my answer to Andrew Ang's slide. <laughs> So, uh, in a guest, for a lot of problems where you have uh, tabular data, this kind of more traditional, uh, like marketing analytics, customer satisfaction, uh, fraud detection, churn for telecoms, it's actually gradient boosting machines somehow, they, they are better in uh, predicting on those kind of uh, data sets. So, this is typically this kind of data that you compile from databases and it's tabular and uh, it's a mix of categorical and uh, uh, numeric variables. And for those of us doing machine learning for 10 plus years, this is not really surprising and it's not really new. Here are like two of my favorite papers. Uh, they are both from 2006, but I think they are not at all outdated. So these guys have looked at about 10 plus machine learning methods on uh, a lot of data sets, and they've been comparing the accuracy across various uh, performance me uh, metrics. And they came up that on those data sets, uh, the top performing models were random forest neural networks, which uh, can be deep too and gradient boosting, and then support vector machines. And uh, at that time, they have used smaller data sets. So on larger data sets, we know now from Kaggle that actually gradient boosting machines, they, they are uh, slightly better performing than random forest. And on this kind of tabular data, better performing than neural networks. But if we play this accuracy game, so we want in our project to predict the best, it's not necessarily that uh, the algorithm uh, matters the most. So uh, to get good accuracy, you still need to clean the data. You need to do uh, feature engineering, which is putting domain knowledge into your modeling. And uh, if you really want great, great accuracy, you probably know from Kaggle that you need to do a lot of models and ensemble them. And ultimately, this is what uh, you need to do. So you have to go through all this process in which you have the data, then you explore it, visualize it, clean it, transform it, and then you get to the modeling. And you have to spend a great deal of time uh, validating the models before you are able to put out in production something that's uh, reasonably likely that it, it, it works well, well enough. And this is something I drew a couple of years ago, but I kind of stole it from uh, Crips. So Crips is this uh, little figure here at the bottom. And uh, this document dates from 1999. So there have been people doing this kind of stuff that's now called data science quite a long time ago. It used to be called data mining at that time. So if I need to give a guess of what, uh, back to the algorithms, if I need to give a guess of what uh, algorithms you should use for your problem, it's kind of hard to give it, but if I need to, then th this would be it. So. If you have uh, structured tabular data, then you should try first gradient boosting machines or random forest. Uh, if you have small data, then there is no way you can do 
anything better than probably linear or logistic regression, some very simple models. So everything else would probably overfit. So if you have like 100 or 1,000 observations, just use some simple mod model because everything else would probably overfit. So if, on the other extreme, if you have very large data sets, like in ad tech industry, it's probably, again, logistic regression just because computationally that's the only feasible thing you can do. So there are like tools like Volpa Wabbit that work really best on this kind of sparse large data sets where you have millions of uh, columns of variables. And you still need to do uh, some kind of regularization, so L1 or L2. And indeed, if you have images, videos, or speech, I, I fully acknowledge that you need uh, to use deep learning because that beats the hell out of everything else. But yeah, if I want to be more correct, I would say that all this, it kind of depends on your data. Uh, another thing you can do, you can try them all. It's not that many methods, so you can just try and then see which is more accurate on your data. You can uh, do hyperparameter tuning, which means that you tweak and tune the models until you get better accuracy. At least with some of them, it's, it's possible. And again, if you really want uh, even better accuracy, then you should do ensemble. However, there is, you do a lot more work if you do all this, and you get maybe slightly better accuracy. So there is this kind of curve of diminishing returns. And feature engineering, again, it's something that usually determines accuracy as much as all the rest. And there might be other goals in your machine learning modeling, so it's not necessary that you're looking for the most accurate model. So by now, I think you know that the title of my talk, Better Than Deep Learning, is kind of misguided, but I think that there is so much bullshit in the media about AI and deep learning that my misguidedness is probably much smaller than that. So I've tried to a little bit bring bring things back to reality. So let's talk a little bit about what is gradient boosting. And to explain it, uh, I'm going to explain a little bit what's a decision tree. So decision trees, you can think of it as uh, you have some inputs, and you want to predict an output. And you're going to recursively partition uh, the space, the input space. And then you are growing a tree of a structure like this, which looks like you have splits on the variables and at different points. And all this, both the variables, the splits, and the whole structure is learned from data. So this is like a simple decision trees. People have been doing this since the 60s. Here in an example on some kind of spam, spam prediction uh, problem, how a tree might look like. So basically, at the end, you have a leaf that either predicts, so let's say you have a binary classification, it either predicts the class or maybe a probability of being in one of the class. So next comes boosting. And the first boosting algorithm that's been successful from 97, again, not last few years, uh, at the boost. So the idea of boosting is that you grow several decision trees, and then at the end, your prediction averages the output of these trees. And uh, you grow these trees uh, sequentially. So uh, every tree you grow, the end trees, it tries to correct the predictions of the first, the previous n minus 1 trees. And the way you do this is that uh, the, predi the uh, 
Uh, the examples have weights, and the examples in the last function, and the examples that the previous n minus 1 trees have missed, have mispredicted, they get upweighted. So that's, that's here, basically. And th this way, each subsequent trees try to learn what the other trees have missed. And this gives you a quite powerful uh, machine learning algorithm that turns out to be very accurate. And the next twist is uh, gradient boosting, which I'm not going to explain. Uh, this is my favorite book on machine learning. The second edition uh, is a free PDF download. And that's quite old, at least in AI terms. So it's second edition 2009 and first edition, I think, early 2000. Uh, so what you do, you do, uh, you do this with the, what Adabus was doing. You do that with the gradients now of the loss function. And I'm not explaining this because actually it doesn't help you understand why the uh, gradient boosting works. It helps you understand a little bit. For example, since you know that these are like weighted trees, it tells you that if you scale variables, nothing changes. So for example, for gradient boosting, you don't need to rescale your inputs like you do for neural networks. So. OK, this is the theory. So what can you use if you want to use gradient boosting? So there are many software that already implements gradient boosting. So there are R packages. There are Python, scikit-learn. There is uh, H2O, XGBoost, Spark, MLlib has a gradient boosting tree. And there are a few others. And I will mention a new one. Um, so all these are open source. And the first question is, why use open source? So uh, Kaggle, I was talking about Kaggles, uh, have done uh, some interview with a few years ago with a Kaggle number one at that time. And they were asking him what's the secret sauce of winning all these Kaggles. So you must come up with some kind of new secret fancy algorithms to predict all these uh, problems. And actually, we were saying that, no, he's just using open source because all these methods, like reading, boosting, random forest, they have good open source implementations. So he would rather spend his time researching and feature engineering what's not that much automated. And. I think the reason why open source is, besides that it's free, I think open source in data science and machine learning has now kind of the best communities. So there are meetups in Budapest too. There are like data science meetup and other meetups. There are conferences. There are books. There are more books than for, for most commercial software. You can ask questions of st on Stack Overflow, and you get answers within hours or day. And I'm sure if we did like a SaaS meetup here, there would be like five people showing up. And at this point, open source in data science machine learning means mostly R or Python. There are also some smaller uh, uprising tools or languages like Julia. But I think probably like 50% of data scientists are working in R and 15 Python. And um, this guy here did the benchmark of comparing this open source software. And it's kind of still like a simple and incomplete benchmark, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the results. So I was comparing this software uh, on a given data set, uh, how much time it takes for training, how much memory it uses, and how accurate is the tool. 
And I have graphs like this, which you can check out on GitHub, uh, which compares the runtime on increasing sizes of data sets, and then also the accuracy. And you can look up the details on GitHub. So I'm going to just tell you what are the three best. So for gradient boosting, and also for random forest, is uh, mainly XGBoost uh, and H2O at the time when I started the benchmark. And then later, uh, two years ago, Microsoft uh, open sourced uh, this other tool, LightGBM, which turns out to be uh, pretty good as well. And if you use R or Python, uh, you're lucky. All this is already wrapped in packages, and you can uh, install all these tools in a matter of seconds and start using them. And using them is actually very simple. So uh, I think that's the next slide. But then the question comes, what about the other ones? Like, for example, Spark. So uh, Spark, unfortunately, it turns out to be like uh, at least 10 times slower than the top tools. And uh, I spent a lot of time trying to make Spark work. And then also the um, Databricks people have seen my benchmarks, and uh, they have tried to make uh, the GBM implementation in Spark better. And what they managed to do better is there is now a nicer API, so you don't need to write like 20 lines of code is maybe like five lines of code now to do GBM. Unfortunately, they didn't improve in speed. So actually, it's kind of slower than before. And also, it has this kind of bug that you see that the accuracy on all the other tools increases if you have more data. But on, on Spark, it's just the same. It doesn't increase as if Spark would not kind of work for big data, which is kind of exactly the opposite of what they are telling you. So, I, so I, yeah, I think at this time, you, I just gave up on, on using or even benchmarking Spark. And there are better tools. So you might ask a question like, uh, why not use Spark? So yeah, it's just because there are better, other better tools. But then you would ask, so. What do I do? I have big data. I can use R. I cannot use Python. I cannot use XGBoost and all these things because I have big, big data. So I think probably you don't have big data. So th there are surveys that tells people that like, most people don't have big data. And also, when they have big data, is the raw data is big. But once, so for example, you have click streams. And uh, if you do analytics, you usually do analytics on your users. So you aggregate this click streams into some kind of profile. You do feature engineering. And, and then your data is much refined and reduced. And by the time you get to machine learning, your data is much smaller than the raw data. And probably will fit uh, in the memory of, of one server. So you're just much better off using uh, single server tools rather than distributed computing. And indeed, memory is cheap. And also, memory is plenty. So this 200 gigs of memory instance has been available on Amazon for uh, three, four years. Uh, you can have now one terabyte or two terabytes of RAM. Uh, and even more. I think now they have four terabytes instances as well. And I look back a little bit and how RAM was increasing and how data sets are increasing. And it seems that actually RAM sizes are increasing faster than data set sizes. So it's not like we are getting bigger and bigger data that will not fit on our one single server. It's actually that our servers are getting bigger and bigger faster than the data is getting big bigger. And again, a lot of people have seen this many, many years ago. And I've been
talking about this for at least uh, four or five years by now. So in a GIST, if you do machine learning, don't use distributed computing for no reason. Use it only if you need it, because the tools will be like clunky, they will be slow, and they will be buggy. So you just, the best is to avoid it. Some people are saying you get to use more computers once you learn how to use one. And I think, again, this is becoming kind of nomen. Uh, it's kind of becoming a known fact that uh, you should try to avoid distributed computing. So I was asking this uh, a while ago on Twitter, and it seems by now uh, at least people following me, which is probably a biased sample, they can kind of know that uh, you don't need your tools to work on bigger data. You just want to, them to work faster. So I took this benchmark and I made a little spin-off uh, to focus just on gradient boosting machines to make it more reproducible and easy for other people to run it. So there is now like a Docker file for it. And then uh, uh, I don't rerun this very often, but I don't think anything changed really since January with this tool. So. I think probably still IGBM is the fastest tool if you have CPUs. If you have GPUs, uh, XGBoost has a very good GPU implementation. So the IGBM people didn't spend too much time on their GPU implementation, so it's not as stable. So, And you can see that XGBoost is really good on the GPU. So this is on larger data, it's getting faster than the live GBM. Although note that here everything needs to fit on a GPU memory, so GPU memory is usually smaller than the standard RAM. And using this machine learning tools is pretty simple. You, uh, you read your data from a file or database or whatever, for some of them, you need to do some kind of one hotkey encoding if you have categorical variables. But then all you do, your machine learning is basically one or two lines of code. And that's the training, and then that's the prediction. So if you use this open source tools, which are available for everyone, you, you, you can do a lot of work with very little code. And the reason I actually like H2O, besides that here it turns out to be the slowest method, is that it has a very nice and easy deployment. So with a few lines of code or a command line, you can export your model and then uh, embed it into some kind of predictive service that's available over a REST API over the web. So that's all you need to do for to deploy a model in H2O. And then you can have any client from R, Python, Java, or JavaScript, or from anywhere, just make requests and get scores. So GBMs are uh, complex things, so they have a lot of parameters. Uh, I mentioned the number of trees. Some of the most important are number of trees, the depth of the trees, the learning rate. This is how you combine the subsequent trees. And then something important with GBMs is you want to do early stopping. Uh, if you don't do, then you overtrain, then your prediction accuracy will look as if it's increasing on the training set, but on a test set or validation set, you would see that actually you're overfitting at some, up to, over some point, you're going to start uh, overfitting. So if you train too much, you would get actually less accuracy. So that's why you need early stopping. And 
all the tools, XGBoost, LightGBM, H2, they implement now automatic all this stopping. So all you need to do is set up a few parameters. So this was not the case a couple of years ago. If you want to do tuning, I don't have time to talk too much about this. So these are two blog posts that I would recommend if you want to tune the, all these hyperparameters, these ones. Um, so if you want to have tuning, you can do various things. You can do manually tune, try to run it with some parameters, and then change it. Some people are calling it, call, calling it uh, uh, student gradient descent because you give it to your students to <laughs> tune it. Or you can do grid search, or you can do random search. And there is a very nice paper by Benjo et al. that shows that random search is computationally much more efficient than grid search. So if you are into tuning and you have to do Grid search, random search, choose random search. Or look, look at this paper, and then you will see why. And also, random search is very competitive with uh, some of the very fancy Bayesian optimization uh, uh, packages for t or methods. I did on this GitHub a little bit experimentation with tuning, so you can check out this. Here are the parameters which I was tuning through uh, random uh, search. And basically, here are the results. So you can check out, if you are interested in tuning, then check out this uh, GitHub. So you would think that if you have more cores, you would get uh, faster training. But unfortunately, that that's not true. So it turns out that some of these implementations, they have problems if on your motherboard there are more than one CPU. So it actually, it can get slower if you have more cores. So here are some experiments where I was running XGBoost on four cores, eight cores, 16 cores. And once you increase the number of cores on this huge instance with 128 cores, you actually get slower training. And this is because the CPUs are uh, linked to memory, and each CPU have its own memory bank. And then if the CPU is calling for, is accessing memory, which is on the other CPU's bank, then uh, this slows things down. And actually, it gets to a point that on 120 scores, you would think that it would run faster if I use this monster instance with 128 cores. It's getting actually almost 10 times slower than if you use just like 16 cores. So here's another thing trying to show uh, what we do when we train and deploy um, machine learning models. So we do this feature engineering, training, tuning, uh, and evaluating the models, and then we deploy it. And you can run your machine learning in production real time or, or batch, and then you get some scores. And then it also matters what you do after that. You should evaluate online the models and monitor the models if they break, and you should do all kinds of checks. And here, almost finally, is like a table comparing uh, the three main, uh, the best GBM implementations. And also, this was first at some R conference. So I had here the standard R package, which is like an old package. But all these others have R packages as well. So the gist of it is if you have CPU and you want the fastest training, then you should probably use LightGBM. If you have a GPU and you want fastest training, you should use XGBoost. And if you want easy deployment, RASC scoring, then you should probably use H2. I was also asking people what 
they are using. And I think XGBoost got really popular with Kaglers three, four years ago. LightGBM is newer, so uh, it's getting more and more popular. And uh, for Kaggles, a lot of people are doing Kaggles, so uh, for Kaggles, H2 is kind of slow, and the deployment, the production deployment doesn't matter. And here is Spark, so basically not many people are using it. What about CPU versus GPU? Again, I think GPUs are new, but uh, you have seen that uh, on some problems, some sizes, you can get faster training with GPUs. So I think that will also increase people using more GPUs. And then finally, I was asking what kind of algorithms you are using a lot of people are using linear logistic regression. And I think that that's actually the top on many, many surveys. Most people are using linear logistic regression because it's simple. And I think I have a bit more sophisticated followers, so, so this one came out top. And you can see that neural nets are kind of less used because a lot of people are ultimately working on business problems. So they have this kind of tabular data from databases. So uh, accuracy wins, basically. Whatever is more accurate is what they're going to use. And they have probably tried neural nets. And they've seen that on many of these problems, gradient boosting machines are actually better. So I have a lot of. Uh, other GitHub repos around this uh, GBMs. So you can uh, take a look at this. You can also ask questions here. I will be hanging out after the break here. So feel free to contact me or just contact me uh, after the conference on this uh, venues. So thank you so much. I have 30 more seconds, so. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I think we have a little bit more time for questions. We will start with a question from Sava. As a data scientist, you need to explain your model and its predictions to your boss. How do you deal with black box models, especially if the decisions in the company depend on your machine learning algorithms? Yeah, that depends. Excellent question. So that depends a lot on the company and problem. And uh, actually, that's the thing I'm working right now. So I'm looking at, uh, so in my business, I don't need necessarily to explain the predictions for credit card fraud. So accuracy wins. However, it would be still nice for like a validation or debuggability to be able to explain the scores. So lately, that's kind of my main project, my main research project at work that I looked into methods of uh, explainability. And you need to explain every single scores. And if you want me, I can give you a few keywords. So Shapley value. S-H-A-P-L-E-Y. That's something that you want to look into if you want to solve these problems. And there are many other papers on different other ways to do this. I don't think, so I, I don't think anyone really solved this problem. So I, there are things that kind of work, and I tried many of this, and nothing really works so far. Okay. All right. The next person is wondering, some say that a new AI winter is coming. What is your opinion on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think the hype is at such a level that we will not be able to deliver what the hype is promising. So if I look at the big data hype, also that hype, like it was like a balloon, but it didn't really explode, so we didn't really fall back. It's just it's getting quieter. So. You don't see too many conferences now talking about big data, or big data is getting less of a buzzword. So 
Unfortunately, AI now means a lot of times just machine learning, so people are just rebranding their machine learning into AI without any adding any value. And uh, we are not really delivering the promise of AI. Even like if you follow the news, like self-driving cars have hit some roadblocks, if you want to say that. Uh, so, but I don't expect like a, right? In the AI winter of the 50s, it was a huge drop and everything dried out. I think more, it will be more like, personal opinion, it will be more like a slow drawback. That makes sense. Steven is wondering, what technique would you recommend for solving sensor data, sensor data or time series problems? Yeah, so time series have been modeled by statisticians for like 30, 40 years. So probably I would start with like simple models. There are also people trying to uh, feature engineer the time series into like a standard machine learning problem. So that's what you can also do. So let's say even in, let's say credit card fraud, we look at how much a customer spent in the last one hour, one day, one week, one month. So this is a way to transform time series uh, problems into standard, more standard machine learning problems. But I think this is, again, something that many vendors are looking into right now, time series, extending their thing to time series. But it's not really solved. As for the next question, Balant is wondering, isn't feature engineering more difficult than GVM, with GVM than with DL? Will handcrafted feature engineering become a luxury? No, so I, I think with deep learning, so deep learning is very successful in images, and people are saying that deep learning learns the features as well, so you don't need to do feature engineering. Or maybe an even better example would be speech recognition, where people are trying to do this kind of deep learning end-to-end, -end where the input is uh, the soundtrack, and the output is some prediction, and you don't need to do feature engineering. and in in these problems, I think indeed deep learning have uh, basically made the feature engineering obsolete. However, in a lot of domains like this kind of businessy fraud detection, churn, marketing analytics, uh, deep learning is not really learning any features. And I, I've seen conference talks where people were saying in the title that they have done that, but then when they were on stage, they were saying that they are working on it, and then maybe in a year or two, they will have something. I'm kind of skeptical that uh, any method will learn the domain just from like a few data points. All right, and I think we are out of time. But as he said, you can find him after the speech, or after the talk, with, so many, with any questions that you have. Thank you very much. All right, thanks.